Hi everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Risk with Dr. Naveen Agarwal, where each week we talk about a topic related to risk management of medical devices. I'm your host, Naveen Agarwal, principal and founder at Achieve, where my personal mission is to help you achieve success in risk management. In this episode, I'm joined by Becky Hebert. She's a quality and regulatory lead at a startup medical device company in Canada. Becky has many years of industry experience, both in the pharmaceutical industry and medical device industry, setting up quality management systems. In this episode, we are talking about balancing the quality system requirements and the need of the business, especially in a startup environment, taking a risk-based approach. We had this conversation as a LinkedIn live audio event in front of a live audience. You're about to hear a recording of our conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome, and please introduce yourself to our audience today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks very much, Naveen. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Becky Hebert, and I am a quality management system expert, I guess you could say. Um, I've been working in medical devices here for, I think, five or six-ish years now. And prior to that, I was in pharmaceuticals. Um, it, with, this is definitely not how I pictured my career turning out when I was young. I grew up on a uh, pig and grain farm in southeastern Manitoba, far away from cities and technologies. Nearest neighbors were miles away. Um, and when I left for undergrad in, in university, I, uh, I realized that I was not meant to be on the farm. Um, and so I've, I've definitely been a city girl ever since. Um, I started my career doing bench chemistry R&D uh, for one of the pharmaceutical companies here in Edmonton, Alberta, and got a chance to do some analytical chemistry with them as well and eventually moved into quality assurance. Uh, what I only realized after I left was that that first company that I was at had an incredibly strong quality culture and quality management system. And I naively thought that every company was like that. Um, I have I have since learned differently, um, but I, I'm very grateful that I got to start my career there because it it set a really high standard um, for for what I wanted the quality management system that I work with in the future uh, to to look like and to be like. Um, and so I I left pharma, moved to medical devices. Um, that was definitely a much harder transition than I was expecting, uh, but it's it's been really fun. I am loving the device world. I really appreciate that there are quality management standards for us to follow in the device world. And, um, and I've, I've spent most of my time working with startups and an early stage companies, mm -hmm. um, either setting up their quality management systems from scratch or kind of transitioning that is it from that startup early stage uh, into a little bit more mature? Um... Yeah, Becky, looks like we are having some yeah. slight slight connection Jane, problem, uh, and I know startup, we I know you are. And I, were talking for a uh, I know Becky, you are you are uh, connecting uh, with a phone today, so I think we are having a little bit of a uh, maybe communication problem here some a little bit of a break so if you could check your signal very quickly that would be great but I want to continue our conversation this is excellent that you are sharing your experience transitioning from pharmaceutical to medical device space uh, so actually that's the first question that came to my mind today is what was uh, the main difference that you saw in the two industries if you could briefly touch on that one of the biggest differences that I've seen um, is is kind of the fact that medical devices they seem to have a lot more um, 
a lot more guidance, a lot more resources around what a quality management system should look like. And is, you know, we have the ISO 13485 standard, we have the US 21 CFR 820, we've got the MDR, the IBDR. Um, and that was, it was really nice when I was making the transition um, because it, it was a really valuable source of information. Um, but now when I try and go back and, and find those same resources for pharma, they they don't quite seem to exist. And I see a lot more initiatives around improving the pharma quality systems. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's one area that med devices has a leg up. Oh, that's great to hear. It's, it's great to hear because uh, in the med device world, sometimes I have come across people having the opinion that, hey, pharma does it really well. They have very tight quality controls. And it's good to hear that, you know, from medical device also, we can contribute to the field. And at the end of the day, you know, we care about patients. So we want to learn the best practices from each of these industries, right? That's what exactly. you're talking about. That's awesome. So, um, yes. Be Becky, you shared with me that you are now, uh, you have a lot of experience with the startup environment. And uh, particularly now you have joined another startup. So uh, can you say a little bit about, more about how you go about setting up a QMS in a startup environment, balancing the needs of the business as well as uh, the regulatory requirements? Yeah, so one of the first things that I like to do is spend a fair amount of time understanding um, kind of the current state and the future plans for the company. Um, how far along in development are they? Are they still at the feasibility proof of concept stage? Have we moved on to what we would consider under the scope of design and development controls? Um, where where are because that kind of um, it helps me figure out what is most important for the company right now uh -huh. in terms of the quality management system. Um, and I also want to look at what kinds of product or products are the, is the company looking to develop and what is their estimated time to market. Uh -huh. um, the type of product is important because obviously a higher risk product, you're going to want more controls, more stricter controls, uh -huh. um, that that safety of the product becomes much more important to insure um, as opposed to making something like a, like a tongue depressor, for uh -huh. instance. Um, and then estimated time to market, of course, implementing the QMS is a project. Um, and so that project has to be completed on time in a way that supports the product getting to market. Um, in on on time, uh, whatever that company's timeline that's, that's, might be. That's very interesting because what and you are so saying here is that for where I am uh -huh. right now, this sorry, yeah. go ahead, me. No, what I was going to say is that what you are saying is that we have to have a strategic view as quality management professionals or let's say risk practitioners. Uh, we need to know the requirements, Absolutely. but we also need to have a strategic view uh, to figure yeah. out what the strategy would be. So it's great to talk about a quality management strategy, working with the business and helping them achieve the business goals, but also prepare for the future. So in, in this context, you can you share like any example that comes to your mind that, you know, presented a challenge to you in terms of meeting requirements through procedures and also meeting the business needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the process of implementing the design and development controls, uh -huh. I find, is is always a good example of a challenge uh, because you're you're bringing in uh, and depending on on what the company was like um, before your quality person joined, uh -huh. maybe they were already doing a lot of that documentation, and so it's just a matter of um, of maybe formalizing it and. Uh, and standardizing the workflow. Uh -huh. But often, and especially if it's an academic, um, a company that was founded out of academics, um, like from a, from a university, for example, uh -huh. um, and I don't want to rag on universities, but they're, they're not always the best at, at documenting uh, uh -huh. what, what they do. Uh -huh. um, and so making that transition from 
very light documentation to uh, to doing the level that's required for design and development controls. Um, and just even getting that idea in that, you know, you can't just change things willy nilly. You have <laughs> to think about it and document it and explain the purpose of the change. Um, that just that that whole mindset I find is one of the biggest challenges. And if you can get people on board with the idea that, you know, quality is not here to stop product development or to stifle innovation. Mm -hmm. We just want to help you take advantage of the work that you're doing so that we can use that work and get the product to market. Wow. that I think that's a great message to, uh, to build collaboration. Uh, now, one question before I, I start inviting folks for uh, for their thoughts, uh, Becky, is how, how, where does risk management stand in this? And what is your view of the connection between risk management and quality management? Mm. So I like to take a risk-based approach, um, not only when I implement a quality management system in terms of what elements I'm going to put in place first, mm -hmm. um, but also in terms of how I build my procedures and my work flows um, not every not every kappa that you're going to open is going to be the highest risk situation for yeah. example and so your procedures should give you flexibility to not do the full rigor of a kappa every time you open a kappa for it uh -huh. Yes, that's that's a good that's a good thought there because uh, we want to do just the right amount of work and not overburden. It should not be burdensome. And I've heard even FDA use this terminology called least burdensome compliance, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was that was one of the things that was actually really hard for me at the first startup that I worked at. Mm -hmm. um, so the the very first medical device company I worked at was also the very first startup that I worked at. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was, there was a lot of stuff that was new for me in that role. And one of the things that I struggled with the most was, um, was feeling comfortable about, about this whole risk-based approach about doing, um, about doing lighter versions of these quality management system practices, uh, like you know, like like documentation, like design controls, like supplier evaluation. There's there's a, a very big um, continuum that you can you know, in terms of, of rigor and effort mm -hmm. and doc documentation that you can and coming from this this pharma company that had this really strong quality culture my instinct was to just well no we can't compromise we have to do it the the best you know the the best way possible right from the very beginning mm -hmm. um and that's that's a nice way to think but it's not very it's not very realistic um and so it was it was really hard for me to um to just feel like I was still doing my job, yeah, uh, properly, yeah. Um, because also as a as a startup, as a, a small company, like there's that element of patient safety, of patient risk, and I was always very concerned that, you know, if if we do things light, well, what does that mean for the patient? Yeah. Um, and since I have since I have gone on to other companies and. And kind of seeing what the regulators expect in terms. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Becky, now the documentation and and effort. So uh, now right? this made me this made me very curious, Becky, because I would love to hear from you. How did you overcome that you, that you, that personal kind of mental uh, mindset? How did you overcome hey. that? Okay, can you share something? Because I'm very curious to hear your personal view. Yeah, I I don't say that I would I I wouldn't say that I have overcome it. Um, it's something that I am still working on, but uh -huh. I've I've made a lot of progress in getting better. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the one of my main motivations uh, was my my boss at the time um, had had said, you know, this is this is an area that I need you to improve on. I need you to find ways to be 
more um more flexible more open more <laughs> more willing to work with the teams on these things rather than me imposing the standards and the way that i wanted to do <laughs> it um again that collaborative we're all working together here towards the same goal um so let's let's not fight each other excellent this is great advice because you know everybody i think we should make the we should think that everybody on the team is equally passionate about patient safety as we are their view might their perspective might be different so let's work collaboratively and not uh not kind of impose our own view right away right we have to be collaborative so that's that's what i'm hearing you say yeah absolutely and one of the one of the things that i found really helps that is when the quality and the regulatory folks when they take the time to talk to the product folks and to find out how do all the different parts of the product work and mm-hmm. how what kind of challenges are they experiencing and how do they view the risk of the device and yeah. why do they view it that way because they have totally different knowledge and background than yep. we do yeah beautiful becky this is great thank you for sharing your personal journey and your thoughts david um you are on so uh, thanks for raising your hand and be- being a part participant in this conversation so i i appreciate you uh please share what you have in mind thank you naveen um and you too becky fascinating discussion um i'm particularly curious about your experience in the startup and coming from both sides i i'm new to this so when you say you came from a uh, medical device to pharma or vice versa how how do you balance the stakeholders involved especially in a startup environment where on one side and this is may, maybe my simplistic way of looking at it you know from an engineering and design component there has to be a very long term quality safety aspect to what you're looking at versus on the business side you know they might be driven more by short term or market facing things um in terms of balancing stakeholder interest do you have any thoughts on that and if it's different in a startup versus a large environment yeah that's a really good question david um it was it was very hard for me to balance those interests in the very first startup that i worked at um and as i as i have moved on to other companies since then i've i've just been you you see more you learn more you you change the way that you think and view things um but one of the things that um that helps me uh, i guess be be okay and be better about balancing the the interests of the different stakeholder groups is um the fact that i i absolutely refuse to compromise on patient safety um mm. i can i can compromise and work around and be flexible on a lot of things but if i'm not convinced that our device is reasonably safe and i i say reasonably um because right now the the company that i'm with we're we're doing uh, clinical studies um first in human clinical studies so there's there's only so much safety you can you can know at this point um but if if i'm not convinced about the safety if i wouldn't feel comfortable using the device mm-hmm. then that yeah. then i'm not comfortable with the direction that the company is going and so i'm going to step up and and push back and, and make my concerns heard and i think to that point becky i i i do believe that your uh company executive or stakeholders actually would expect you to have that mm-hmm. uh temperament because they want information from us right they want information to make the right decision and if we make so many assumptions and don't inform them of the potential kind of blind spots i feel like we're not doing our job right so what you are saying makes Absolutely. a makes a lot of sense to me that we are the champions of patient safety of business of everything but it's our our role to provide the information so um let me see now roger and chehaji you have also joined thank you for joining uh david hang in there you know if we have time we'll have more conversation on this topic okay so i don't want you to leave uh roger roger i want to invite you to share your thoughts first go ahead please roger can you hear me yeah okay yes. go ahead sorry had to find that button again no problem uh, go ahead <laughs> so 
here's my 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 question for uh, Becky is this. Uh, you had mentioned that with the startup teams, how important it was to be collaborative and work with the team to get them to see maybe a more your your view on the risk analysis uh, part of it or the risk uh, concept. In my experience, it's yeah, when we would have the the development team meetings, there was even in small companies, there was a representative from quality and, and maybe the risk portion of quality, a representative from manufacturing. And the point was so they could see what was coming, to see how things are going, to sit in on the technical decisions about how are we going mm-hmm. to attack this problem and all of that. So in my experience, it's been every one of those functional groups thought they were providing the best possible input that really came down to the details to arguing about in the, in the context of risk, how safe is safe enough. That's where most of the conflict was. I'm just interested to hear your experience on, on some of these uh, perhaps very inexperienced startups. Yeah. Um, the the risk part is always always tricky uh, with the startups. Not just not just in terms of actually doing the risk management activity, but even just. Um, understanding what the standard is requiring. Um, ISO 14971, the changes from uh, the standard um, has has definitely very specific. There's there's a lot of um, words are and when we're used. Yeah, Becky, I, you are you're kind of going in and out with your cell phone connection. So let me um, let me try to kind of share a few things while uh, we wait for you to come back, Becky. Just just hold on for a minute. This is Roger. It's a great question one, that, that you're asking. Four nine seven one. Becky, uh, uh, your connection is a little bit kind of going in and out with the phone. So let me let me fill in for a little bit. Uh, Roger, this is this is a great question that you are asking and. Where where I view this is the it's good to have actually disagreements in the team environment. It's good to have heated discussions. Facilitation becomes important, right? Every every function feels they're doing the best they can to your point. And it's good to have that conflict or a conversation. But what we want is at the end of the day, everyone should be on board with whatever is decided, right? There should be no kind of after the meeting conversations or side conversations. We should be working as a team. And if anyone in the team, I think the environment should be that if anyone in the team is uncomfortable, they should speak up because we are all equally responsible for that. So whether it's a small environment or a big environment, I'm sure, Roger, I know you have done in, done work in this area. There is disagreement on technical issues too, right? What technical approach to take to deliver the functionality? What is the engineering approach? There's a lot of conflict. So um, the more we talk about it and the more honest we are with each other, I think the better the outcome would be. And a part of it has to do with us taking ownership and not giving up. Uh, so Becky, I know um, you were trying to say something. If your connection is a little bit stable, I would again invite you to share your thoughts. Yeah, I think what you mentioned, Naveen, about not being afraid of, of conflicts and disagreements um, is is really interesting and a very a very good point because um, we we're often worried about harming the relationship. And yeah, that's that's not what a conflict or a disagreement is. We're just fine. We're trying to find the best way to keep the patients safe and keep the business going. And if we can all remember that, yeah. then our conflicts and disagreement they shouldn't affect our relationship. It should help us to be more collaborative. In fact, what I feel is that if we hold back and don't contribute later on, actually, we will create more conflict. So hold that thought. Yes. I know there are two more people uh, waiting and we are almost running out of time. Uh, but Jihaji, you have been waiting for a while, so I'm going to invite you to speak and share your thoughts. 
Uh, thank you, Naveen and Becky. I'm really learning a lot. I'm currently doing my master's in uh, medical devices. So this program has been really wonderful for me. My question to Becky is, um, does she feel like uh, there is a gap between risk management? Is risk management effectively enough in the development of medical devices? Becky, you wanna you wanna share some thoughts? Yeah, I think there's still um, I, I think it's still treated too much as a as a checkbox activity. Um, yeah, there's I my Mike Drews is my absolute favorite risk person. Um, and I've I've listened to a lot of his content and he has definitely influenced the way that I that I think about uh, risk and just medical device uh, requirements in general. Um, but yeah, it's it's not it's not a checkbox exercise. It's what we're doing to make sure that the people who use our devices, are going to be safe and that we are when when we send out a product into the market we have said that the risk of that product we are okay with those people being exposed and experiencing those risks um, and so if if we're saying that we're okay with that then we should actually be okay with that it's it's not an exercise that we do to generate a report or or a pretty graph it's how we can convince ourselves our customers the public that it is safe you can use our device and that we know the potential risks that we are exposing you to we've thought about them we've controlled them the best mm -hmm. that we can mm -hmm. um, and we still think that this device is right for you that's that's an excellent thought, Becky. Because at the end of the day, it's a judgment call, and yeah, you, and you have to have check and balances on judgment, right? So, I always share with people that involve cross functional experts. Don't make safety decisions or risk based decisions without involving your medical professionals, right? We are if we are in, without that, we cannot have good judgment. So, part of it is also taking a step back and saying, are we making the right judgment? All right, uh, uh, Christy, mm -hmm. you have the last word, so I'm going to invite you to share your thoughts. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Becky. Um, I also help a lot of really early stage startups, and um, one of my experiences is uh, when I first start working with super early experience, I always start with like all of my first and mind, right? So with risk management, so we walk through things like. Why do we do this? Why does it matter? Um, acknowledge their hesitation. Um, invite them to say out loud, why do I why do I not want to be here right now? Why does this feel a little burden? Um, and then walk all through, you know, why does it matter? What would it look like in the court of law if we didn't do this? What are the activities going to go from? What does it really mean to remember by John, you're gonna do this? Or this, will, this is my expectation for the time period um, for how much involvement I'm getting. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, to kind of bound it, um, that if you have similar experiences in your career, who are brand new, you know, the little guys, I always say. Um, but I guess what are some of your practices for like setting up on the wall to try and cut off some of this, like creepy, you know, and the hesitation piece? Yeah. Uh, great question, Christy. And I, I love the way that you call it hearts and minds trading. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I might have to borrow that from you. That's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. um, so one of one of the things that I do and, and that you mentioned as well is communicating the why. Um, and this this is something that I learned when I did my my MBA from a from a Simon Sinek video, he's he's all about the why mm -hmm. and getting that um, that buy in or that believe in um, is pretty much impossible to do if if you're not if you don't have the why uh, because it's especially when you're talking about a, a small inexperienced group of people who are doing this for the first time. Um, you know, they they know they're they're choosing to go into the medical device world. And so they know that there are rules and regulations. Um, but do they 
Do they really understand why they are in place? They're not just there for fun. There is a reason. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that I've started doing as uh, as part of the training that I give to to startups and earlier stage companies is I actually go through a history of the health regulations in the major markets that that company is looking at and just kind of show them, you know, uh, if we're talking about the U.S., for example, we had in, in 1906, The Jungle was published by Upton <laughs> Sinclair, and that got people absolutely outraged over how their their food was being processed and stored and, and sold and all of that. And that book led to the creation of the FDA as we know it today. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think just giving them that that background, showing them why these things are in place and what they are meant to help do. It's not just rules that we're blindly following. There is a reason. Yeah. And one thing that I picked up in your question, Christy, is this whole notion of empathy. Empathy yeah. for our team members also, right? You empathize with them and recognize and acknowledge the feelings that they might be feeling. And I love that. I love that idea of empathizing with our own team members, our own business. At the same time, advocating for the patient. In some ways, guys, aren't we asking a lot from quality regulatory professionals? It's not an easy job, right? It's not an easy job. So, guys, I know we had fun. We had a lot of fun discussing this. And as always, we find ourselves at the end of this half hour. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, in a moment, I will invite Becky for some closing thoughts. But uh, I want to share with you a few housekeeping points. First, as you know, most of you, we meet every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So, if you are interested in these conversations, just block your calendar and show up if you can. If you cannot, there will be recordings available in future. And for that, you can join my Let's Talk Risk newsletter. Uh, a link is provided to you in the comments section for this event. A second point, most importantly, is I want to hear from you. Let me know how you are feeling. You can reach out to me through direct messaging. Uh, raise your hand if you want to be a guest speaker. You don't have to prepare anything. I know all of you have a lot of experience and insights to share with us. Uh, so please don't hesitate. This is going to be a lot of fun. Everybody seems to like it. And many people are showing up week after week. So I, I just really appreciate that. Becky, with that, uh, could you share with us just a few closing comments to take away from this conversation with you? I think the one thing I would say is that the what whatever you end up doing with your risk management process, with your quality management system, always keep patient safety at the forefront. There are, are thousands of medical device companies and there are thousands of ways to do risk and to put a quality management system in place. But at the end of the day, as long as you can prove that you're keeping the patient safe, that's really the most important thing. Wonderful. Have the patient in mind and many times we might be the only one advocating for the patient. Uh, great, guys. What a wonderful conversation. Becky, thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for raising your hand and sharing your insights. Roger, David, Christy, Chihaji, can't thank you enough. It's not, uh, without your participation and engagement, this is this cannot be an interesting exercise for all of us. Uh, we are not here to be lectured. We are not here to have big slide presentations or webinars. I'm sure there are many other opportunities. And Mary Jane, I know you were asking to speak. And even though we are out of time, I never say no to anybody raising their hand. Guys, if you're running out of time, you're welcome to sign off. But I want to welcome Mary Jane. I just want to thank you all. Um, I'm a retired 911 police dispatcher from San Jose PD, 20-year career. And I want to say right on what you're all doing. Um, and I want to wish every man here a happy Father's Day. Thank you. you. all deserve it. Thank you, in Mary. In Jesus' name, I pray for all of you. Thank God you, Mary. God bless you all. Thank you, Mary. Bye -bye. And thank you, thank you for your service. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks. With with that is, again, thanks again. Have a good weekend. We will see each other again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank thanks very much, Naveen. This was a blast. Great, great. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you.